Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill and the moderator for your favorite gallery talks every evening this week. Uh, this week, we are talking about drawing. We're talking about mark making and surface with uh, three very skillful, masterful artists. Lee Newman, who's teaching a drawing class, although he is a very fine painter, but we all know drawing is the basis for most paintings. Kelsey Wales, who's teaching a colored pencil uh, drawing class, as she also paints, designs toys, works in two and three dimensions masterfully. Yuli Wang is with us for the first time. She is a very skillful Chinese calligrapher, and that is the subject she is teaching with us this week. She's also a masterful musician, and she's going to share a little bit of that with you tonight. We're going to begin with Lee Newman working in black and white with his students this year. Take it away, Lee. Talk to us about who you are. Well, thank you. I'm going to um, share my an image first. I'll and I'll use the images to uh, tell you about who I my journey as a as a uh, as a painter printmaker. And um, so I've I've opted to uh, to take that route and not show uh, a lot of drawings. I have a couple of drawings, but. Uh, this is a this is a painting. I, I started not as a figurative painter. I started as more of an abstract painter, um, and I had to find my way to the to the current work I do. Um, and th this is a, a little still life painting I did when I was eighteen or nineteen and as an undergraduate. And I was very interested and in the thralls of abstract expressionism. Uh, and so this was a still life that I uh, had to, uh, that I set up in my studio that had to do with sort of biomorphic abstraction. Can you um, enlarge it to fill the screen, Lee? Yeah, let me do that. How's that? There you go. That's better. Even bigger if you can. Oh, uh, that may be as big as I could do. Okay. Just skip on down. So I did that as an 18 year old. And um, when I went to uh, art school, I was, I was challenged and disabused of some of my ideas about painting, although I, I was very much still in the thrall of abstraction and abstract expressionism. And I was fortunate to have studied with a couple of great abstract expressionists. Uh, Grace Hartigan was one and Jack Torkoff was another. Um, and in this, this is a undergraduate painting uh, where I was really trying to absorb the, paint the figure, but absorb the figure into the surroundings, uh, something I didn't quite understand. Um, so I, I took a gap year between undergraduate and graduate school, and I had done a lot of uh, drawing and a lot of drawing from the figure. And so because I didn't have access to the nude model anymore, I found uh, figures who were ready to pose for me in the pastures where, um, of New Hampshire. And I started doing studies of cows and so on. And in that, that throughout that whole year, I um, gradually learned to establish the anatomy of the cow, like a human figure, but also to compose very quickly uh, a group of cows a, a, um, in a pasture. I then went as back to from, from undergraduate school back to graduate school uh, with a lot of questions and um, I was unsure of, of having pursued a degree, a second degree in, in art if I wanted to do that at all, but I, I completed it. And um, at the end of that year, I applied for I, uh, a Fulbright grant and I received that. I, went, I was a Fulbright scholar to go to Austria. And I did not know at the time that it was very competitive. I, I didn't realize that I was competing with all the best um, musicians in the country. And so I, as a consequence, I was the very first painter to go to Austria as a, on a Fulbright. And during that time, I did not really have a studio. So I went to um, out into uh, the city to cafes and to, in this case, the, um, the big open air market. And I would sketch and paint. And I did this oil sketch on panel 
which it, as one can see is drawn with the brush. And it uses a lot of the elements that I'm teaching currently in drawing, negative and positive shape, light and dark values. But this woman who was a, who I go to regularly, she was uh, weighing potatoes, and that was her scale. Uh, that experience for me going into and going to Vienna um, was was profound. I I had the I had privileges at the time to and to go to the the largest collection of prints and drawings in the world, and that's the Albertina. And I could look at anything I wished. Um, in, um, Rembrandt drawings and etchings, Goya etchings, Klemp uh, uh, drawings, all sorts of things. Um, and when I came back to the United States, I it was a difficult transition. Um, I must say that it's going getting outside of one's culture is is uh, is scary, but also a, a great learning experience. And I think Common Ground is really good about um, exposing all of us, teachers and students alike, to what it means to get beyond your comfort zone and to be exposed to new ideas from all, all over the globe. So when I came back to the United States and I've been drawing in the um, regularly in the cafes where you could sit for with a the price of a cup of coffee for hours and draw. And I did not, at that point, we didn't really have cafes. And I realized that, oh, our fast food restaurants were our cafes. And so I was an habitue of McDonald's and at that point, Roy Rogers and other places. And I would go and um, order food, and but draw the, the people who were there. And this is, this is a young person eating at, um, and so this is a, an, an etching, L or dry point. Chicken McNuggets. I, would, I feel, I'd like to think that I was really the, one of the first artists ever to capture the act of eating chicken McNuggets. Uh, I was on, on the avant-garde in that, that way. So I, to this day, um, and this is a more recent painting, uh, consumption and eating is uh, is a sub theme of mine, and um, one of the most difficult challenges of of, of getting beyond a, a, um, an art school experience is to find your way, find the, the themes and the subjects you're interested in. Not just so much the subjects or techniques, but what it's about, why, what you have to say with that. And so um, I've always looked for to. Um, my painting and drawing for that. And sometimes I uh, impose that on my work. Other times uh, it's imposed on me. Um, and of course, with going to fast food restaurants and eating, I, I found that, um, well, these, in this case, an etching of French fries, which is a glorified drawing. <coughs> um, and the, so the, the food itself became the subject. And I did French fries and and um, paint hamburgers. I like the fact that I could, in some restaurants, I could load up my ham hamburger as I wished and paint it. In this case, I, I this was a the French fries bag of French fries was like an open mouth, dig disgorging the uh, the shapes inside. Uh, the, as still, so I've explored all different. Subjects and themes. This is a, uh, you know, paintings, a painting of uh, peonies, to, which decay very quickly from my yard. And um, uh, my when I had gone to Vienna, um, which is a, a very uh, Baroque city, and with a great collection of work from the Baroque period, I was um, very influenced by the Baroque drama of of light and dark as well as uh, a still abstract expressionist dynamism and in these these peonies I was really interested in in using thick and thin paint and um, bringing that to figuration uh, some of the things I admired about uh, abstract expressionism of course um, in since I'm a printmaker also 
and, and, and printmaking is an extension of drawing. It's the formal extension of drawing. In the old days, um, you used to be able to, if you wanted a degree in drawing, you had to per pursue it through printmaking. And so I was forced to do both. And so th these are, again, flowers from the garden. Uh, I guess it's a tulip and um, primroses. And my, my challenge was to be able to make the, the tones and textures simulate or feel like color that feel as rich as color. Something I, to this day, I uh, like to do with printmaking. So other subjects and themes are, I, I, as, a, as, and as a young painter, I was very interested in painting portraits and I used to get family members and friends who didn't last too long to sit for me uh, for portraits. And I, at, at 19 and 20, I was a, very capable portrait painter. But at 22, I had more questions about what I wanted to do with my art. And so I, um, this, is, this is not a, a, a portrait as such. It is what is called in Dutch painting, um, a trony, a, a, a characterization. The uh, girl with the pearl earring is a trony by Vermeer. Um, and so I was very, as with the, Flowers, I was very interested in drawing with the brush and finding uh, in the simplest terms, bold volumes that describe the, the um, tectonic plates of the head. Uh, and a nice thing about having grown up in Washington DC area suburbs is exposure to some of the great museums in the world and the fact that they're free. I used to live at the Phillips Collection, the first modern museum in the United States. And in fact, many of the a number of the teachers I studied with had been students and teachers at the Phillips Collection, which indicates my age. Uh, that's when the Phillips Collection had an art school. Um, th this drawing I'm showing you is by um, 16th century artist, uh, Flemish artist, Jacques de Gain, a much earlier artist than uh, who was a, who influenced uh, Rembrandt. And uh, I, I've seen many a great show of drawings at the National Gallery. And I've, I've go, they, those uh, shows have gone on to not influence me, but Jacques Degain, I've, he's he sits at my um, shoulder often. And uh, I, I, I saw a major show of his, and this was a, a, an example of one of his drawings. I love the uh, fact that like many artists I admire, he, would, he scrutinized nature in its entirety. He looked at everything from the, the toads to um, uh, any people on their deathbed. And um, so at a, at a certain point, um, when I had a, a new Springer Spaniel puppy and had just come back from the, um, from the dentist for an extraction, my puppy was uh, clamoring for my attention outside in the yard. And I went out and he was barking at a toad and I, so I pulled up my drawing pad and I started, the toad was out of reach of the dog. So I started doing these sketches of the dog, channeling Jacques de Gain. And, uh, and I did that sketch. And before the Percocet wore off, I did this as well with ink and chalks and um, composing the thing on the page. I mean, now go a little more quickly. Now at a certain point, um, that is my soon to be 30 year old child son, uh, Ryland. And uh, poor thing was asleep in his um, uh, carrier crate in, in the car. And I put him on the dining room table and painted him really quickly. And he having a child yielded a number of subjects I wouldn't have guessed in still life. In this case, toys that I was constantly picking up. And in this still life, I wanted to do a still life of unstill objects. Same is true of that, this etching of the top and it's constantly spinning. And uh, so st still lives, another subject that is dear to my heart is landscape painting. And uh, I mean, as with the traditional landscape, I'm interested in the big shapes and, and, and uh, the dynamism of, abstract expressionism, that would be a spring painting. Here's a 
a fall painting where the, the fallen leaves have turned into russet red uh, and an etching um, done with um, in a technique called uh, spit bite and um, sugar lift of trees that's near the Potomac. Uh, and of course, um, and landscape lead is, I've explored in a lot of forms, suburban landscape. This is a, an apartment building in suburban Bethesda, Maryland. And of course it has a, this is Chevy Chase apartment painting uh, uh, subject similar to it. An additional subject that I've, I've liked very much is, uh, well, figure. And, and, the, and this, this was a model I hired regularly. She happened to be homeless and that caused me to uh, go out into DC and in the, usually in the weekend and draw homeless people, he's on a bench. That became a subject matter that was um, a sub theme of mine. And then um, additionally, I, I've talked about this in prior talks at, at Common Ground, um, aging and Alzheimer's in particular. And I did a lot of drawings at, a, at an Alzheimer's unit uh, for an old um, Alzheimer's home in, in suburban Maryland. And those are definitely dependent on drawings. And so, I, and I was interested in being able to depict the dignity without the pity of the condition. Here's figuring out how to deal with the decline going in, into darkness. And this is, my mother is currently in, an, in a retirement home. And so I've done a lot of sketches. Uh, and this is an oil sketch from where she lives in Prince George's County. Uh, and this two, uh, two states of a print. The one on the left is the first state uh, in, in, as a line drawing, essentially a dry point drawn from the model. And then uh, I decided I'd pick up the plate at a later date and I had uh, other things I wanted to do to it. So I added the big areas of tone to it um, to go further with it. I, I'm an avid printmaker largely because um, it helps me further my ideas in my work. And I see that this print, I've got an, another minute or so. Um, I did, this is the largest tree in a local little town of Asila, Morocco. Um, uh, like five or six years ago, now I got a phone call inviting me to, to go to Morocco as a, as a printmaker uh, uh, representing the United States. Um, uh, and I've, um, and, and um, I was able to participate in the, uh, in the Asila Forum Foundation, which is both a, for political talking heads, but also for artists from all over the globe to come. And they, the artists, the visual artists paint murals throughout the town, but there's a, a group of printmakers um, led by the, uh, uh, a uh, famous group from Paris uh, who, and we're, we just do prints and exchange ideas and printmaking. And um, th during the time I was there, I, I saw this, this tree looming over the, the studio. And so I, this was the one of the prints I did. And I, I picked it as, as a sort of an exclamation point to get me to stop talking. Thank you very much uh, and for listening. Well, thank you, Lee, that you've taken us many places all over the world. I really appreciate that. You've mentioned many, many mentors. I had the great good fortune to see a show of Sir Francis Bacon when I was in Switzerland. And then I'm trying to think if it was Ireland. Ah. Where they had a recreation of his studio. Yes, they do. They do. He he and I are born on the same day. <laughs> what a coincidence! Right. Well, it is a coincidence. So I've I've taken him on as. Uh, let me say this to you, Linda. That's you make a good point. You can. Uh, there are lots of points I could have made in this talk. Um, you can't choose your biological family. You can choose your artistic family. So I've included uh, Francis Bacon as as a great uncle. 
uh, and and I have I have a very large artistic family. Many of the many of them you'd know. And yeah. I know I couldn't help but but think about that commonality as I was looking at some of your portraits. Yeah, yeah he's expressionism. Well, figuration expre expressionism is is uh, and and that's you know that's inherent in every mark one makes actually. Well, thank you. Our thank audience you. is going to soon come to realize that we have a trio of not only masterful artists, but excellent teachers. Lee is well known as a lifelong master teacher. And we have a new, a relatively new, but soon to be considered, we consider her a master teacher. And that's Kelsey Wales. Kelsey has many media. I'm not sure what she's going to include tonight, but she's taught a lot of things with us uh, from toy making to the colored pencil drawing that she's teaching with us now. Uh, Kelsey, take it away and show us what your, your presentation is going to be. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Um, so like Linda said, I am doing colored pencils this week, but in the past at Common Ground, I have done toy making with uh, vinyl toys. Oh yeah, um, and just sculpting in general with uh, polymer clay. Um, none of which is currently within reach. But if I can sneak away at the end, if there's a couple extra seconds, I'll try to show off some of that stuff. But um, yeah. So this week we are doing a colored pencil um, drawing with uh, mostly Prismacolor colored pencils, which are really lovely, very accessible. You can get them in almost any store now. Um, and we've been learning and playing around with different textures and different ways you can make this incredibly simple art supply do a number of different things. Um, you know, figuring out how you can take what's in your head and put it on paper, whatever kind of paper, colored pencils are happy with it. Um, they're great at blending, they're great at adding all sorts of things. And you can put more things on top of them. You can paint over them. They're a great accessible art supply that is good for beginners and professionals alike. So um, I'll share my screen because I have some pictures as well. There's Discord. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so this is a PowerPoint that I did. I'll try to make it full screen if I can. Um, PowerPoint's changed a little bit over the time, so might not be able to. But um, there's me and my studio, uh, which is where I'm sitting now. So. Uh, that's what I look like when I had glasses. Um, so I've been using colored pencils since I was about 14. Uh, so that's very nearly 20 years ago, which is bonkers to think about. Um, but they are a very easy, portable art supply that you can do a lot with. Um, so some of those pencils I definitely still have. I have this great big bin of pencils to um, my left-hand side here, which is just full of pencils, some of which are very old, some of which are very new. Um, but what makes color pencils so lovely and so useful, at least this particular kind, is that they have ingredients in them that allow them to blend together very smoothly, but you can also build on top of them layer after layer after layer, as many layers as that paper will hold, which is almost indefinite, which allows you to have a lot of different um, kinds of color, kinds of sort of uh, luminosity, um, which can give you some really fun effects. So we've been talking a little bit about how you can do that in class and blending and adding colors that maybe are supposed to be there or adding colors that maybe are not supposed to be there or you wouldn't expect to be there, um, which is what I like to do. I like adding colors into things that are unexpected just because it's fun. Uh, and that's just something I really enjoy. Uh, so when you can do something with colored pencils, you can also, because colored pencils sit on top of your paper, which is, you know, it can be a computer printer paper, or I usually like something a little thicker, like a cardstock or a Bristol paper, which is just a smooth, thick paper. Um, colored pencil likes to sit on top of that paper. And because of that, you can put other art supplies on top of it for fun special effects. So you can put paint on top, you can color over it with um, 
markers or Sharpies. You can put gel pens over it if you want like a little metallic sheen to it. Um, in this little uh, preview image right here, you can see where I've put some white paint for some extra sharp contrasting highlights because there's only so much you can get through just the general white of a paper. Um, so that's a fun additional thing that you can do with colored pencils. Uh, and because they can just add layers upon layers upon layers, um, you can just add as much color as you like to a drawing. And these pencils come in a variety of different colors, so you can make your own or use one straight out of a box. Um, and as far as what I like to draw, uh, when I was a kid and I got these things, I was drawing things that I enjoyed, you know, things from movies, things from video games that I liked, which was really fun. Um, and, you know, growing up right when the internet was starting to be a thing where young artists could post their work, it ended up getting to the point where other people who liked, you know, these things like video games and music and art and you know, whatever was out that was something I was enjoying, um, those communities would come together. And eventually, sometimes that ends up getting you work in those fields, which is really lovely and really wonderful. So um, at some point, someone got in touch with me and they said, oh, I, I love I love Queen. I love Freddie Mercury. Can can I have you draw this portrait? Um, so sometimes you get really fun work doing that. And I know that this was um, eventually entered into like an official queen. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, it was for a music video on YouTube and they were going to just put in a bunch of fan art that people had done. And I don't know if that project ever got completed, but I know this got sent there and I got a receipt for it, but I have no idea if this ended up in it. Um, but this was a portrait I did back in 2019 and it was one of the ones I really liked. Um, but this is mostly colored pencil with just some pl splattery paint in the background because that is what the commissioner wanted. Um, there was a, an album that they did that had a lot of that same texture that they wanted as a detail. Um, but a lot of the things that I like drawing, uh, I have always loved Doctor Who. It's a very cheesy British sci-fi show that's very lovely. Um, and over the many years that I've enjoyed it, I've posted a lot of work about Doctor Who online. Um, and it's led me to get some official work done for the show, which has just been a dream come true as someone who's just a fan who can then work uh, doing sort of official illustration works. Actually, when I'm done sharing my screen, they had a drawing that I had made, they made into a TV show prop. They made it huge and it's very threatening when they send you a, a giant poster size of a drawing that you made because it's a, of a frowning person that looks very grumpy. Um, but these are all, you know, people who I have either really liked in show or people who I have admired as a person. So there's, you know, there's John Lewis down there, really awesome person. Um, so, you know, I love these actors and they have a really fun, interesting face shape. So it's always interesting to see how you can sculpt those facial details with colored pencils with different layers of color um, and contrast. It's always very fun to get those fun textures in there. So you can get a lot of interesting texture detail with colored pencils by using little lines or just in the direction that you color in. So it's fun. I love looking for subjects that have interesting textures in it. So this is a very cozy knitted scarf. This person, I just wanted to play with different lighting. So I decided instead of like a normal skin tone, I just wanted to play with blue green. And that was literally the only reason why I decided to draw that one. Um, when I do these illustrations, I then go to um, art shows and conventions up and down the East Coast. So actually this show, um, Shorely, which is a Star Trek convention, uh, shows up again this year, next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And last year, uh, Gates McFadden, who played Dr. Crusher in Star Trek Next Generation, was there as a guest. And I had drawn this portrait as a sort of thing that folks could enjoy. And she got a copy and was kind enough to sign one for me. But um, I just really enjoyed watching the show that I enjoyed a whole bunch again, find a put the show on pause a couple different places and just draw a portrait of someone I admired as a kid. I love 
the texture and color of her hair. The fabric was really fun. Um, it was just a really, really fun portrait to draw. Um, I went to college and I studied language and history and art as much as I could. Um, and I'm someone who loves a lot of nerdy things, but I also love art history as well. Uh, and there is a show that I always enjoyed as a kid uh, called Trigun, which is a big, silly, nerdy anime. And there's a character in it who loves geraniums. And there's a famous painting by um, uh, Rembrandt Peel of just one of his sons with a bunch of geraniums. So I took that painting and I made a recreation of this character with the geraniums because I liked the painting and I liked art history and I liked this nerdy show. Um, so sometimes it's fun to combine all of the things you like into one uh, very niche place. Uh, and it was just fun to, to work with. Um, I don't know how many people would recognize both of these things together, but it makes me happy. So there's that. Um, so all of my colors are usually really oversaturated just because it's something that I think is really fun. Uh, sometimes I'll pause a video game and I'll just say, oh, well, I'm going to mess with those colors a whole bunch and I will draw that character later. So as a kid, I loved playing Final Fantasy games and they did a remake of one I really liked. So at some point I drew one of the characters from that during my holiday break when I wasn't teaching school. But um, colored pencils are really great. They're super accessible. You can work with them by themselves. You can put paint over top of them or in the background like I did for this portrait. Um, it's just a simple watercolor background. And then the person here is in colored pencils. Um, so there's so much you can do with it. And I have been using these materials for almost 20 years now and I'm still learning new things all of the time as I continue to play and explore with things that I enjoy um and it's been a real treat and a real joy seeing my students even in these first two days learning new things and new things that they are exploring as they mess around with these art materials so that's pretty much all the pictures I have to show so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But one of the cool things about drawing things that you like is eventually someone will notice it who may work on the thing that you're making fan art of. And they will then say, hey, would you like a job um, for this illustration project or this? You know, we noticed that you draw a lot of things from here. We need an illustration. So this big, angry pink guy behind me whose nose I am picking Um They'd seen this small picture I had drawn and they said, hey, we would love this as a background piece in a show that we're doing. Do we have permission to sort of buy this picture from you, this portrait from you, and we'll make it into a prop. And when we're done, we'll mail it to you because who doesn't want a, you know, a gigantic table sized frowning pink person just hanging in their basement. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a little alarming when I taught Zoom classes uh, during the pandemic. They just referred to him as the angry pink man. Uh, so we would like put like a piece of paper over his mouth to make him smiling. We put googly eyes on him. It's ridiculous. But it's lovely uh, to be able to, to do something that you enjoy and then have it recognized by people that you also admire. So um, in class, we are playing to learn, which is, I think, the best way to learn. So today we were exploring textures. So we were drawing different um, textured things. So we were talking about, you know, fuzzy objects. So we were drawing, I had this squirrel puppet that has an interesting texture. How do you make your pencils read that kind of thing? We had, a couple of us had this exact same weird dinosaur toy, which is very bumpy and very lumpy. So we then drew him, even though he's upside down on this paper. We were talking about all sorts of different things to explore what we could make our hands do, what we could make our pencils do. Um, and it's been really fun because, because we are playing and because we are learning new things, no one is really afraid to try difficult things, which I've been so proud to see. They're, they are trying difficult things because they know they are having fun and learning from it. And I think that that is such a wonderful and special thing. So, um, Last but not least, as far as size and paper that I use, um, I wish I had a better answer, but 
I used to just buy cardstock paper for a printer at Walmart and then they discontinued it. But most of the time I'm working on pretty small printer sized paper. Um, this was a sketchbook I had bought exclusively for the reason that it was $4 and it was Bristol. So it's just a nice smooth paper. Colored pencils work on anything. They are very accessible for everybody. I wish I had a more interesting answer for the size and the paper that I work on, but it's usually just small stuff you can find anywhere. So that is, that is essentially it. Have fun and draw things you like, and sometimes you get a job out of it. And teaching is a joy. So, Congratulations on the Queen Commission. I absolutely loved it. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, I love Freddie Mercury. He's the best. best. Yep. We were in Rome when they broadcast Queen from Albert Norman Hall. Wow. And we walked into a little restaurant and the chef was also our waiter. Mm -hmm. And he said, do you like Queen? In perfect English. He said, you're an American, right? Do you like Queen? And he happened to have a voice similar to Freddie Mercury. Oh. And the whole group in the restaurant sang right along with Queen from Albert Norman. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. Great, great fun. Well, thank you, Kelsey. Uh, I'm always amazed at the spectrum of your work and the vitality of it. Uh, it's, it's just so energetic and pleasing to my heart and soul. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yuli Wang. Yuli is a carrier of her culture. Um, we try in each cultural strand to have true representatives of that culture, like Terrell Tapaha with, with our Native American path. Um, and, and Yuli certainly is a carrier of her culture, of her language, of the customs, and, and of the uh, pristine uh, and beautiful art form of Chinese calligraphy. I've always heard that it's pictographic, uh, like, like uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, for example, and several Native American languages are pictographic mm -hmm. so that uh, rather than having an A to Z alphabet, it's, it's based on images. And Yuli's going to tell us a little more about her art form, herself, and her culture. Welcome, Yuli Wang. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for this uh, great opportunity to be here to introduce uh, um, Chinese art, this uh, amazing and uh, ancient art form, and still alive uh, till today. Um, I um, I graduated in the uh, Tianjin Academy of Fine Arts of my college. Um, my major was uh, graphic design and fine art. And after I went to the uh, graduate school in the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, uh, my major was uh, art history and minor in uh, uh, calligraphy. And then when I moved here, I I teach at U UMD, University of Maryland. Uh, I teach Chinese language and uh, involve my art and the music. And uh, to me, art and music and the teaching and work uh, is my daily life. I really enjoy it. And thanks to give me this uh, wonderful opportunity to share my work with you. Uh, let me find my... PPT. This photo I took this year is a late, late when every year when we when we celebrate the Chinese New Year, uh, we will write a couplet to decorate the outdoor and the entrance door with a very good words and I wish a, a good luck for the new year. And uh, this year uh, I wrote a lot couplets. And for my decorate my house and uh, give it as a gift that gave to uh, friends and we celebrate the Chinese New Year together. Um, the calligraphy um, 
in China or right here in the Chinese life, you can find everywhere, everywhere. But uh, um, also Chinese calligraphy could be work with uh, any different uh, artist. Like this one, we have a uh, workshop, um, Arabic, uh, Arabic uh, calligraphy and Chinese calligraphy. Uh, when we write the same meaning of the characters, I use the Chinese characters and they use, uh, they use uh, Arabic uh, calligraphy. And then we want to see what difference between. And see this, uh, when we do this, uh, this is the, the, the photo. See that the center part is a Chinese calligraphy. Uh, the, the character, two characters, which means a bo ai, means a great love. Uh, uh, great love is a uh, Arabic uh, calligraphy, and this one's a uh, Persian calligraphy, and you can see, and it's very different between the, uh, the different calligraphy. Even the English calligraphy also very beautiful. I love it, and you can see the calligraphy. We have uh, similarities. We focus on the, the the beauty of the lines and the composition of the line between the lines and the dots and the, the movement of the lines. And, and the same as the Chinese calligraphy and the, the, the movement of the strokes and also the lines and the com combination between the lines and the, the circle and the, 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 the different strokes uh, and with the different dots, uh, this, uh, this is the similarities between the different uh, calligraphy. And also because the, as uh, Linda, you mentioned, the Chinese characters is a very different, very unique. Uh, it is not a spelling language. It is, a, we, use, we use the uh, strokes combined together to, to write characters. And uh, at the first uh, uh, period, the most the Chinese characters are pictograph. And it's uh, the symbols and the picture. Uh, um, uh, this is my work. I really enjoy to um, uh, teach a uh, uh, combine um, the the, uh, the research about the history, the calligrapher calligraphy's history and the history of the the. the in China, of China, we combine together. We do a lot of research uh, and presentation, uh, my students. And to me, I try many different uh, scripts uh, of calligraphy. And this is why I combine, uh, I combine um, standard script and clerical script and a grid seal script in one uh, in, to my Rush writing it is my personal uh, style. And this one, it is a cl uh, clerical style. Clerical style. And this way, I combine the grid seal and the clerical, uh, most of the uh, cl grid seal and clerical. This one, this one is a uh, between the um, uh, standard script and the clerical scripts. I combine them together, which is I love it. I always want to try to make my character flat, my stroke is bolder and full of with force, and then um, the, the the whole shape is flat like a grid seal, which is I love that shape. Um, but uh, the, the strokes, I like the, the movement of the um, uh, standard uh, 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 script. Other than, other, other than um, brush writing, I also uh, do a lot of painting. Um, some painting is just ink. You just use ink to make a different color. Um, it depends on the amount of water you add you can you can make a different uh, uh, type of the color just with it between ink and the color and the, and the water and this only ink and black and no no color only black 
uh, different black, different different color with uh, uh, by ink, you still can paint different objects. Now, from the different color, you can you can feel the flower petal and the, the, the trunk of the tree. Uh, it's a very very rough. Uh, very this part is very old, and then the new branches comes out, will grow out, and then here, uh, f uh flowers flowers. Uh, the, this one, this flower is a Chinese um, plum flower. We love to uh, paint this flower because this one represented the inner beauty and the strength. Because this flower uh, blossomed during the winter time, so the, the hard weather, but this flower, uh, especially when we have snow and the, the red or yellow or white color flower blossom. Doing this under the snow, They're very beautiful. And also, I I do a lot of uh, Chinese paint with color, and this one uh, is a um, this spring, uh, this spring I I painted. Okay, this one's a detail. Okay. When I when I came to uh, uh, America, this country, and I noticed because uh, traditionally Chinese uh, Chinese painting we use a uh, uh, rice paper like uh, like this rice paper, and uh, we have many different uh, different kind of colors and a different uh, material to make rice paper, and uh, after you write or paint on a rice paper. Because this uh, rice paper is so soft, and after you paint it, you have to mount it on on the back to make a surface, to make surface, and that give you a good color, a good detail and the result. But uh, it is an other big job to mount the the, the uh, painting Chinese painting. Right here, this is not easy to find a person who can do this. The the to mount. Uh, uh, Chinese painting. It is a special major uh, in my uh, college. Uh, um, it's very special. So therefore, I try to paint on many different material to do the Chinese painting on the different material. Like this, this is a fabric. Um, this one is my my dress. Right now, it's my dress. I I I paint two different color. And I also do Chinese painting on the canvas, and I don't need to. I don't need to mount it after I finish. I can just hang on the wall to, as a decoration. Uh, this one is very. This piece is very huge. Um, like uh, uh, Kelsey, uh, she loves a cartoon, loves the the, the characters of the, from the video and the computer game. And any uh, novels? Oh, I love your work so much. Your your work makes me like. I I really want to take your class. <laughs> uh, and me, I I love nature. Uh, I fell in love with nature and the flowers, landscapes, trees, leaves, everything. I, I this is what I like. I love, and I paint I paint different colors of, of the peony. Um, but this one is a uh, is a canvas, uh, a canvas board. I use a Chinese Chinese painting techniques to do Chinese painting, but uh, paint on a different uh, material. I think, uh, um, I think um, in the whole world, I I have until now I haven't found any other artists that use the do Chinese painting on the this kind of material. Uh, um, it, it is my uh, my way to try to uh, use a different material uh, to do Chinese painting. It's a very very challenge. And this one, this one's uh, Chinese painting. The Chinese painting we have uh, uh, many different kinds, uh, different way to do painting. This one called the fine lines painting um, because the the shows. See this one show you the use the, the fine lines to emphasize the, the stru uh, structure of the objects. Uh, this one is a, a, the, the um, lotus flower. 
I paint this on the watercolor paper. This one's a watercolor paper. Uh, this one's kind of uh, big uh, watercolor. And this one's a rice paper. This, this one's a rice paper. And this one also is so, a uh, watercolor. This one, this one I paint this um, uh, uh, lotus flower on canvas. This one's canvas, canvas board. I paint, I paint the background color first, and then I paint the the flower after. And this one is a, a plum flower, uh, uh, black. Uh, I use ink to paint the uh, trunk and the branches and uh, Chinese color, red color to paint the flowers. And the Chinese flower could be, uh, uh, can uh, paint on a silk. This one is a silk fan. So after I finished this. So every year I visit, uh, I visit uh, aquatic garden in DC. Um, there is a huge lotus garden and there's so many different kinds of lotus. And every time when I back from there, I couldn't wait to paint. Okay, this was uh, um, this year, um, uh, this spring, I think April, uh, in, by end of April and uh, uh, earlier May, uh, when the um, Westeria blossom in my backyard, um, I planted this tree and um, I've been, I think it's been five years and this year blossom. Uh, I, I, I'm so happy. And then I do this painting. This painting is on the, the, the paper board. The paper already mounted. So right now it's a very convenient. You can find many different, different uh, rice paper already mounted. This is the detail. This also is fan. It's a, it's a fan, different shape. And I also paint a uh, peony flower. Uh, this is a peony flower. Okay, this one, the landscape. This landscape is a very huge piece. Um, this is called um, Blue Green Mountain. Uh, Blue Green Mountain, Qinglu Shan Shui in Chinese. Um, this is very, very, it is classical. Uh, uh, form of the Chinese painting, um, well known from Song Dynasty. Song and Tang, Tang Song Dynasty, these two dynasty, they are well known about, about this kind of painting. Um, this one I painted on the, the different material. It is like a plastic. It's a combined, the, the man-made material. Uh, actually, this one's like a curtain. Uh, like a curtain, usually if your living room, uh, we usually have a big window or door and during the summer, too much sunshine. And we try to use uh, use this one, uh, uh, this curtain to try to, to keep uh, the heat away, also keep it private. Now, I painted this, uh, this is the detail. I love this, this color. I, this one, and you can see the detail, even um, under the color, you can, you, you can see it, can see that the strokes, layers by layers, because of this material cannot absorb more water and ink and color. So I have to paint the layers, 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 and this one, each part, each part at least five or six layers. But you cannot, totally cover the, the strokes uh, by a color. It is not good. You still need, you, you need to try to show the different color by the, by the way, you still need to show that the underneath the strokes. It, it is the typical Chinese painting and Chinese color, only Chinese color can do this. Other color like a oil painting, uh, even the uh, pencil or uh, uh, charcoal or uh, uh, watercolor, but when you paint the second time, usually you will cover the for previous color, uh, but it's not in uh, a Chinese color. Chinese color can show you the layers 
Um, it's the, the very different, very unique part. Okay, before my living room, I, I paint on fabric and I use, I use the black fabric color, but I use the Chinese techniques uh, to do this painting. And then later, um, I changed this one. I changed this one, blue green mountain. Now you can see the mountain, this color this is not from my, my painting. This color combine the real sky color. And here, the cloud from the sky. And this curtain, you can, you can see through from this inside to outside. And the color when the sunny, uh, the color combined together, it is so beautiful. Okay, this is the, 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 the entire piece and that I, you can see even, even on the canvas, I painted on canvas, not a rice paper, but I use the Chinese painting techniques and the Chinese color and the ink. And you still can see underneath the strokes. Okay. Okay, this is my, my three huge piece. A green, a blue green mountain landscape. I paint a fence. The, the, this landscape, I paint a fence. I with my fan outside. Oh, uh, because I think I I really hope in the daily life we involve the, the art everywhere. I don't, I don't hope um, the art just stay in the, inside the museum. This is what I, my purpose. I, when I teach my students, so you, you can enjoy, you can appreciate the different art. But uh, by the way, you can actually do art. Let art in, involve your daily life, not separate with your life. That's why I paint my clothes, I paint my shoes, my bag, my hat, uh, everything I want to uh, paint. Uh, my t-shirt, uh, my fence. Uh. Okay, uh, this. Uh, oh, I want to show you my a, a few pieces of my students' work. Uh, this one, they, she only learned one semester um, one semester uh, uh, calligraphy, I, by end, they can use the clerical, uh, clerical style uh, script to write a full poem uh, composed by the by from Tang Dynasty. Uh, the students work. And then students can do uh, Chinese painting. This one just ink, uh, this is bamboo. Uh, the students, students work. Okay, um, because of my backgrounds, um, I always mm, mm, I always apply art and the music into my uh, teaching. Uh, this one is uh, for my Chinese uh, calligraphy class. Um, every every semester we have a special event. I will invite a, a guest a guest speaker like the master in Taiji. Um, and I will play the traditional Chinese music instrument um, as, as a meditation uh, yeah, music, and then uh, to help students to understand the movement, how to, how to hold or how to apply the force uh, inside from their body and uh, body to, to try to move their body uh, because the Tai Chi movement and the class at uh, a brush writing movement, uh, same, all handle controlled by your force. It's me last summer. And this summer, next month, I will visit Aquatic Garden again. And finally, uh, I will show you my um, uh, uh, video, uh, uh, which is a Gu Qin. Guqin music, this, this instrument is Guqin. 
um, traditionally uh, in China, every scholar, if you are really successful or good scholar, educated the people, every educated people, you have to know these are four, these four elements. Uh, first one is qin. You have to know how to play qin, this instrument. And second, you have to know how to play Chinese chest. Uh, and the third one, you have to know how to write calligraphy. And the fourth one, you have to know how to do Chinese painting. Qin, qi, shu, hua, the music and the play Chinese chest and the calligraphy and Chinese painting. These are four things for every educated people, no matter what field you're expert, you, you should know how to do this. Okay. Uh, this video I finished the last, uh, last year. This piece is called Flowing Water. The Flowing Water, this piece is a very ancient piece of the Gu Qin music. The Gu Qin, this, this uh, music describes the great friendship between the the, the spiritual friends who understand deeply each other.
it's a really long piece. Okay. Thank you. Very beautiful, Yuli. Thank you for sharing that. I feel like I've taken a little mini trip to China. I loved it when I was there and I loved you taking us there tonight. Thanks to all our speakers this evening for bringing us into their world of drawing, painting, of surface, of texture, of color, of the intention of their art beyond just the thing of beauty. Uh, I really appreciate your expertise as teachers, and I think it showed in your presentation. Tomorrow night, we will investigate the world of fiber with knitter Nancy McKenzie and Keith Taylor, who is a masterful basket maker uh, and a, a very amusing speaker. You're in for a treat. So please join us the same time tomorrow evening about 6.30, tune in. And Thursday, we will talk with the gang that's teaching Plant Speak. Friday, you have a special treat with Don and Ellen Elms. Last year, they introduced you to a very important project they, they have completed in Tazewell County. And our Friday talk will take you to the celebration of the completion of that very meaningful mural. Thanks for joining us. I'm Linda Van Hart. Be kind to yourself and all of those around you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.